So, Throne of Glass. It is, um, no secret that I hate this one. Uh, you can watch all my previous videos on the subjects. It is not a good one, okay? The main character is an ungodly Mary Sue. The story stretches on forever and ever. It becomes actual... Yeah! Partway through. Might have to censor that word. It's early in the video. We'll see. Most of the romances are obnoxious and take up way too much time when they're not outright toxic. The world building is lazy. It's just... It's not a good series at all. However, this series was a massive success. Like, even 10 years after it came out, it still sells reasonably well. And basically, every young adult fantasy that has come out recently has tried to be Throne of Glass. Like, they are all just trying to copy that success. The exact same way that everything tried to be The Hunger Games for a while, and before that, everything tried to be Twilight. It was... Ugh. It was... It's annoying, okay? Like, I don't get why they're all trying to be Throne of Glass, because, again, it has all these issues. I, I find that weird. It has the ultimate Mary Sue protagonist. Well, okay, with the exception of House of Night. House of Night does have a worse Mary Sue protagonist, but still. The story structure is odd, the world building is thin, etc. But that said, I do see some potential in this story. And I was thinking for a while, like, okay, let's do another rewrite video. And I decided on this one, and while I was going back over the story and going back over my old videos on it and stuff, I was realizing... I don't think I would need to change all that much to make this story passable, at least. You know, because, again, it's just a couple of big issues that if you tweak it, then that makes the whole thing substantially better. I see some potential there, so let's exploit it. And if you're unfamiliar with this series or this format, basically the format is me taking books I've read that I think are pretty bad, like I've done it before with the Onision trilogy and Trigger Warning and Light Lark, and I'm just changing it to make it better. Uh, however, the idea is to make it a better version of the story the author was trying to write, not to make it into a story that I would write instead. So, I'm trying to change as little as possible, and I'm trying to keep the basic story in intact as much as possible, trying to keep the basic character, personalities, and archetypes intact as much as possible, etc. And if you're unfamiliar with the series itself, uh, it is about a girl named Selena Sardothian, <laughs> a.k.a. Aelin Galathinius, which is amazing names, by the way, I, I swear, these, these are beautiful, uh, who is a famed assassin who was caught a little while before the story began, and then the king of the country they're in, Otterlin, comes out and tells her, hey, you can be my champion if you win this tournament, and then the first book is the tournament, and then after that it becomes a matter of her fighting against the evil king. And I don't want to go into a lot more detail than that, right now because of spoilers, but the rest of this video will be very heavy, spoiler heavy, so just be aware of that. If you don't want them, then goodbye. I don't think you should read Throne of Glass, let's be clear. It was originally intended to be a trilogy, but it got stretched out to be eight freaking books in total. Like, it is ridiculously long, and there's not much there that makes it worth reading, but it's only fair that I warn you about spoilers. So before we get into the summary of the series and talk about major changes, just a couple of minor changes that we will just keep throughout the whole thing. Uh, number one being that Selena slash Aelin will be an assassin. She will not be a warrior. Because that was one of the things that made her an obnoxious Mary Sue, is that even without magic at the beginning of the series, because if you haven't read it, the first couple books, there is no magic in Otterland. Like, it just disappeared a few years before the story began, and no one knows why. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But even without magic, Selena can take on, like, 20 armed men by herself and kill them all without getting a scratch on her. And she can just fight all kinds of experienced warriors and everything. And that, that kind of annoyed me, because she's an assassin. She's not a warrior. Like, she knows how to fight. Okay, that's grand. But shouldn't she really be good at, like, infiltrating? You know, sneaking into places she's not supposed to go, getting access to things she's not supposed to have access to, and then taking out her target and leaving without anyone even noticing she was there. Like, to me, that's what an assassin should be. Like, if you're a famous assassin, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> like, Lee Harvey Oswald is a very famous assassin. He didn't do the best job. Like, he took out his target, sure allegedly, but he also immediately got caught and killed afterwards, so he only did that one target. So, I don't know, I just feel like we should make Selena 
a, more of an assassin. You know, she can be a decent fighter, but she's not like world class. And she's more good at sneaking around, infiltrating, disguising herself, things like that. Number two might be my most controversial change here, but we're gonna split this into two series. Because like I said, this was originally supposed to be a trilogy, and if you read it, book one feels like a prologue, and then books two, three, four feel like they're structured like a trilogy, and at the end of book four, they actually take out the evil king, and like that is the end of that conflict, but then they decide, oh, okay, actually there's an evil demon king too that we gotta fight, and the rest of the series is about fighting him. So I would just say, make the first four books its own series, and then the last three books, we'll just split that off and that'll be like a sequel series. You know, it'll be the same characters, but it'll take place later and they're fighting a different threat and everything. Like, nothing wrong with that. It'll make it a little easier to keep track of for people. And it'll also make it so that if you just stop at book four, you won't really feel like you've missed anything. Number three, this one's a little vague and I apologize, but we're just gonna trim a lot of the subplots, particularly, particularly the romance subplots. And... A lot of these, you don't even have to get rid of them entirely, like you can still keep them there, but they just last so ungodly long and take up so much time. Like the last book is pushing a thousand pages. It's freaking ridiculous, man. We don't need hundreds of pages describing uh, side characters going on these long ass journeys and falling in love with each other. Like at that point, if you really want to add that, like make a spin-off story or something, make a spin-off collection of short stories where you can show all these subplots that you liked and they won't distract from the main story. And I genuinely think that even if you don't get rid of these, even if you just trim it down a little bit, remove the unnecessary bits that aren't contributing that much, then I think you could make this entire series like 30% shorter in total. And believe me, when a series is this obnoxiously long, making it 30% shorter is, it's a godsend, it really is. And I know a lot of people try to say that anything that doesn't directly uh, contribute to the main story is filler, and that's not true, that's not what I'm saying here. Uh, but in the case of Throne of Glass, a lot of it really is filler. And finally, number four, uh, we're just not gonna put any porn in there. Like really, I, this is a young adult series, so I just don't think that should be there to begin with. Like, if you want to put that in adult fantasy, go for it. Have fun. I, I don't have issues with that. But I don't think it should be in stuff that's being aimed at kids and teenagers. I, I just don't. Uh, and on top of that, it's obnoxious that it comes in halfway through. Because if that was just there in the book from the beginning, then, like, I think a lot of people, myself included, would just go, eh, this isn't really my thing, and then just head off and do something else. But the fact that it takes four and a half books before we get to the hardcore sex scenes is really obnoxious. Like, I, I believe I mentioned this in my uh, review of the original series, but I was actually listening to the last couple books as audiobooks, and I was at the gym with headphones in when the first hardcore sex scene came on, and I felt so awkward. <laughs> Never in my life have I felt so uncomfortable and awkward in a public setting, but I don't know. Okay, so that's all the minor things that'll just go throughout the book. Uh, so just assume that that is being said whenever we go through this, and now we'll start. So, like I said, in the original series, we start off with Selena already in prison, and she is brought out by the prince, who's named Dorian, and a guy named Kale, who is the captain of the royal guard, and they are there on behalf of the king of Otterland, and they just say, hey, if you fight in this tournament, then you on behalf of the king, then you can be the king's champion, and we'll let you out of prison, and then after, I believe it was 10 years of service, you can go and be free. And like I said, it's weird that she is an assassin who's so well-known and so world-class and the best in the world, but she's already been caught and arrested, and she's like on the verge of death. And it's mentioned that she tried to escape a few times. It's implied that her last escape attempt was more of a suicide attempt, really, like she was hoping the guards would just kill her on the way out, but they don't really go into that much detail about it, so... In this altered version, we're gonna leave it more or less intact. Like, she will still be in prison and people will still come to get her, but the thing is, she'll be in hiding. Like, she's not gonna be there under the name Selena Sardothi. <laughs> Again, this name is just, it's, it's just beautiful. I, I don't know why so many young adult series have characters with ridiculous names, but it's beautiful. Uh, she's not gonna be there under Selena Sardothi, and she's gonna be there under a different name, and specifically, she's there hiding because she's trying to get to a target who is in prison. You know, maybe she's trying to kill the warden, or some criminal person she was hired to 
kill or just somebody, but like she's there on purpose because that makes her look a lot smarter and more competent. You know, it makes her look like more of an assassin and then, oh, okay, the king just found out who she was and these people are here. And they also have that implied threat of, hey, if you don't come and help us out and do what we want, then you're just gonna stay here. Like, we're, we're gonna lock you up and you will never see the light of day again. So in the original, and obviously in this version, she will agree. So Kale and Dorian will take her to the king. They will meet with him briefly, and then the tournament will begin. And in the original book, the tournament is really just a cover. Like, they're actually sacrificing all of the fighters in the tournament to demons because the king is working for demons. We'll get into that more later. Uh, but it's really just an excuse to kill all these people and sacrifice them. Uh, and Selena is doing well in the tournament throughout the whole book, but it's also really not focused on that much. Like, there's one part where it mentions that the contest was knife throwing, and it happens completely off screen, and then in like two sentences it just says, yeah, Selena won. In the rewritten version, Selena will instead be brought there by the king specifically to eliminate threats to his power. Like, he'll still be having a tournament, and he won't be possessed by a demon. Okay, he'll be working with the demons, maybe, but he will be, like, on his own. He'll be more of an ally with them than a subordinate. Uh, but he specifically wants to eliminate threats to his power. That's why he's bringing in all of these nobles and their most powerful servants, and some of their most powerful servants are also, like, their family members and children, and he's specifically going to have Selena eliminate them one after another. And he's telling her, like, hey, if you win, you get to be my champion. If you fail, then you'll die anyways and it won't matter. And he'll make her the same deal, like, hey, 10 years of service after this, and then you get to go free. And she will maybe be hesitant for it, but at the end of the day, she's like, well, I don't have much choice here. So she agrees to kill all these other people in the tournament. This will make the king look a little bit more competent and maybe more evil, to be honest. Uh, and Selena will have a variety of options available to her. You know, she can take them in straight-up fights sometimes. She might, uh, again, sneak around and kill them while they're sleeping, or she might drug them to make them easier to take out at other parts of the tournament. You know, you, you could do a lot with this. Again, she's an assassin. She shouldn't be somebody who is, like, super morally conflicted and going, oh, am I doing the right thing when I kill these people who are also kind of evil? Like, no, she should just be a cold-blooded killer or at least mostly a cold-blooded killer. Like, if you're going to have your main character be an assassin, commit to it. Also in the original book, uh, Selena was treated almost like a royal guest. You know, she got this super nice room and she was constantly going to the library and reading tons of books and she got nice dresses and all the best food in the world and everything. And it was a little weird. So in this version, we'll have her be treated well, but not like royalty. You know, she'll get like, her own room, which should be, like, windowless so that she doesn't try to escape. Uh, and it'll have, like, a nice bed and everything, but that's about it. She'll, she'll be properly fed, properly cared for, but she's not gonna get a whole bunch of luxuries because that, again, distracts from the fact that this is not a super pleasant situation for her to be in. Uh, and so from this point forward, Selena falls... Like, she kind of seems to be falling in love with Prince Dorian in this first book, and then... In the second book, they just forget all about that and have her be in love with Kale. It's it's weird. And then later on, they have her <laughs> switch to a different guy again. Uh, and so I think that in this, we'll keep it more or less the same. Like, she tries coming on to Dorian, doesn't really work because he's just not interested. So then she immediately switches over to Kale, like, in the first book still. And we will have it be so that we, we actually focus on uh, her needing to feel like she's loved, you know, like she just, is just constantly going from relationship to relationship and possibly having a ton of sex, maybe not, uh, doesn't really matter, but she's just going from relationship to relationship because she needs to feel loved in some way because, again, if you, once we get to her backstory, she has lost a lot of loved ones and everything. She has been used almost like a tool, uh, so she's really, people only want her around because she's useful, it seems, and so this will be like, almost like a pathological need and th this is just how she goes through life and keeps herself sane, and we can actually bring attention to it and focus on it a little bit. And then all the love dodecahedrons and shit that happen in this series will be a little bit less uh, self-indulgent, I suppose. After that, we'll leave the story pretty similarly. You know, she'll fight opponents, she'll uncover sinister plots, she'll maybe spy on the king a little bit and wonder, like, what's he up to? Things like that. 
Uh, we will also leave some hints that she might be the lost princess of another kingdom that was conquered a while ago. And we'll return to that later, but like, again, spoilers, at the end of the second book, it turns out she actually is a lost princess, and that, that's why she's called Aelin Galathinius, as well as Selena. Uh, but we're, we're actually going to hint at it this time so it doesn't come out of nowhere in the second book. Like I said, without the obnoxious subplots and the obnoxious length, like, 70% of my problems with this book series would just disappear completely. So, yeah, like, I don't have a whole lot of uh, specifics to say here. Like, obviously, there's still some improvements that could probably be made, uh, and I don't think that this would be an amazing book if that happened, but it would be much, much better. It would be at least decent. And eventually, Selena will win, and she will be named the champion, and that'll be the end of book one. And then we go on to book two. So originally book two is basically just Selena killing a whole bunch of people on behalf of the king. She is at the very end revealed to be a princess of another kingdom who was thought to be dead and is also part fae. Uh, she loses one of her friends and Kaol is partially responsible so that's why she just kind of falls out of love with him. Admittedly that part does make sense. <laughs> you know, it's not like she just gets bored with him and then moves on to another guy. Like he, he does something pretty bad to her, and she's able to forgive him for it, but she's, all the romantic feelings she had are gone. And then at the very end, she leaves the continent and goes to the uh, kingdom of Wendlin across the ocean, which is a fey kingdom ruled by her great-grandmother, and then it goes to the next book. And I would say we leave it pretty similar. However, when we get to the twist about Selena really being Aelin Galathinius, the lost princess, we will have her be a bastard child instead. See, like, at the very end of the, of the book, originally, Kaol actually finds out who it is, and he, like, rushes to the docks to try and stop her, but then she has already sailed off, and he, he's too late. And he's like, oh, okay, well, I guess, yeah, she, she was Aelin Galathinius all along, we just didn't know. But rather than her just being a plain old princess, we'll have it be a little bit different. So, there will be uh, Selena, who is just a bastard child, like, her father was fooling around with one of the maids or something, and then she was born. Uh, and also we'll have it be so that the Fae side of the family is her father's side rather than her mother's side so that she can actually keep that ancestry. Uh, and then there was Aelin Galathinius, her sister, her half-sister, who who is trueborn and was born at about the same time. And then as they grow up they realize like, hey, you two look exactly alike. And Selena is treated decently enough, but she is never going to inherit anything that's made very clear. Uh, and she gets along great with her sister and all that. But then, uh, one day they'll realize that Aelin, the true-blooded princess, does not have any of the crazy magic powers that she's supposed to have, and Selena does, so their fa- and their father, for whatever reason, just can't have any more kids. So they'll just say, okay, Elena, or Aelin and Selena are going to switch places. So now Selena is going to take the name Aelin, and she'll be- Officially, she'll be the true-blooded princess, but she really won't be, and then her sister will be forced to uh, be, live as a bastard. And then the whole shit will go down where their kingdom is conquered, and the original Aelin will be killed, as, along with the rest of the family, and so Selena the Bastard will escape, and she'll start going by her old name again, but really she is still the lost princess, sort of. So she's almost like two people at once. Like She's trying to keep her own real identity while also pretending to be her sister's identity, uh, and this will probably put her under an immense amount of stress, and it, it would make sense why uh, she might have some mental problems going forward, as opposed to just in the original book where it's, yeah, my family died, wah, like, what, what a fucking baby, am I right? And at first, when Kale finds out that she is the princess, he'll think that she's the original one, but then she'll, she'll clarify later, like, no, no, I, I am a bastard. In fact, that could be almost like, a secondary twist to this. Like, at the end of the second book, we could all be like, oh, okay, she's the lost princess, and then in the third one, she could come out and say, like, no, not exactly, and then explain the whole backstory. So it's like a, a double twist, almost. That that would be kind of interesting, I think. Uh, and it would actually, again, it would put a twist on the, oh, the main character's a lost prince or princess trope, you know? Because that is something that has been done a lot, and so many times, It and it just, again, is one more thing that makes Selena seem like an ungodly Mary Sue, whereas this, changing it around a little bit, will be somewhat different. And also, she's just going to be called Selena the entire time, because for the first three books in the original series, she's called Selena, and then after that, they just decide, okay, she's Aelin now, and she just starts going by Aelin. It's annoying. I think in this, we'll just call her Selena the whole way through, 
and maybe publicly she'll be known as Aelin, but privately her friends will all just still call her Selena, and the narration will still call her Selena, because that way it's not obnoxious and difficult to keep track of. And other than that, yeah, book two will keep mostly the same, except for the minor issues I brought up earlier, and again, when you trim out the subplots, a lot of the problems are gone. So then we go to book three, and in this one, it's probably the best in the series, but it's still not... It's still not good. It's mostly just Selena training her powers, becoming, like, the heir of fire. She learns to, like, take out entire armies with her massive walls of fire, etc. Uh, she finally accepts who she is, and she accepts her position as the princess, or, well, now that her family's gone, she's the queen. Uh, she also meets a fae named Rowan, and they fall in love, and they are, like, together the rest of the series. Uh, and then, meanwhile, back in Otterlin, uh, some others, including Kale and Dorian and them, are planning a rebellion against the king, and they realize that uh, all the magic is gone because the king put up these three massive towers around the continent uh, a couple years ago, and they realize, okay, if we just destroy one of them, then that will break everything and magic will return. And then the king finds out about this, and Dorian, the prince, winds up getting this collar put on him, so he's possessed by a demon, and then uh, that's the end of the book. We also introduce a new character named Manon, who is a witch, and witches are actually their own species in this world, and they're pretty interesting. Like, Manon is not an amazing character, but she's better than most of the rest, and in fact her storyline is very disconnected from the others in this book. It only comes in the next one. It comes with the others, but whatever. We'll d Again, we'll just trim down on that a little bit, and other than that, I think we'll leave the witch stuff mostly alone. Because, honestly, again, Manon is a better character than most of the others, and the witch stuff, like seeing their own unique culture and everything, is much better than most of the rest of the series. Like, I'm, I'm not joking, it's, it's pretty good stuff. So, again, we will just leave that more or less as is throughout the series. So as for changes, we will make it so that Maeve, uh, who is Selena's great-grandmother, who is like this ultra-powerful fae who never seems to age, ever, even though, like, Fae are supposed to age, they just do it slowly, but Maeve has lived much longer than any Fae should for some reason, and no one knows why. Uh, we'll also have it so that Maeve knows that Selena is a bastard. Like, she might try to pretend to be the true Aelin at first, but Maeve will know, because she's just, you know, she's that powerful, that knowledgeable. Uh, and in the original story, Fae really should have taken over the world, because they are just so much more powerful than humans, and when they uh, interbreed with humans, then even generations later, those humans still have a bunch of fey powers and uh, fey, I don't know, features in them. So it really seems like the fey and uh, the dem demi fey, I believe is what they're called, should have like in almost outbred all the humans at this stage and absorbed them uh, into their their own race. Really, uh, in this version, this alternate version, we'll have it be that. The Fae have not done that because when they leave Wendlin, they get much weaker. Like, they they might still have some powers, like when they go to Otterlin and such, uh, normally, but, but now, like, the magic there is gone completely, obviously. Uh, but they are just much weaker, like, they aren't a whole lot above humans. Like, if they leave Wendlin and live in Otterlin, then they'll start aging like humans, uh, their powers will be on about the same level as humans, and it's only once they return back home that they will return to their full strength. So, in that way, uh, it would be pretty much impossible for Otterlin or anyone else to, like, ever invade them or take them over, but simultaneously it would be very difficult for them to go out and invade and take anybody over, and it would also make it so that even if they intermarried with, like, other royal bloodlines and stuff, they wouldn't completely take over uh, those countries. We'll also make it so that Dorian the Prince has a good relationship with his father, the evil King of Otterlin. Because, see, originally... Dorian was like, oh, my dad used to be kind of nice, but now he's just evil and cold and everything, brah. But that that's just because he's possessed by a demon, and that's like a really lazy cop-out, I think. So I think rather than doing that, we'll have something a little bit more, um, uh, just, just more interesting and cooler and more realistic, where Dorian and his father will have a good relationship. Like, he'll be a good father to his kids, and maybe even a good husband to his wife, we don't know. Like, he might just be a nice guy personally, but he is still an evil king who is willing to kill, torture, murder, steal, and conquer other places. Like, he, he will be a nice father in private, and then in public he will be perfectly willing to, like, execute anyone who stands against him. And that 
is a real thing that a lot of like nasty dictators and stuff have had. Like some, a lot of them have had good relationships with, with their kids and such. And so it'll take Dorian years and years to actually realize this. And it's only like once the story begins that he realizes, you know what, my dad really is evil. We need to get rid of him. And at the end, when Dorian finally stands against him and says, no, I'm going to try and overthrow you, the king will still like collar him. It, it won't possess him but with a demon this time. I think it'll just be something magical that allows the king to control him directly. Uh, and he, it will break his heart to do it. Like, he won't just be totally cold-blooded, like, okay, I'll enslave my son forever, that's fine. Like, it'll hurt him a lot, but he'll also feel like, okay, I have another son who can take over after me, and if I let Dorian do this, then everything I've tried to build is going to come crashing down. And, so, like, again, we're making him... He'll be evil, but he will be a human being. Like, there's going to be a person underneath all the psychop underneath all the psychopathy. That's a hard word to say. And then we go to book four, which will be the end of the original series, remember. And uh, originally, uh, Selena, who from this point is just... Now she's just referred to as Aelin, which is annoying to adjust to. Uh, she returns to Otterlin to overthrow the king. There's a bunch of drama, like a bunch of interpersonal drama and love triangle shit. There's a couple of action scenes. They, they come across Selena's old boss and they have to fight him, which is a very long, obnoxious subplot. And then eventually they, they win. They do defeat the evil king, uh, but at the very last minute, he reveals that, oh yeah, I was actually possessed by a demon the whole time. I was good and nice. And then he just dies, which is... Like, that is a twist that is straight out of every shitty JRPG from the 90s, and I despise it so much. So obviously that won't be there. And obviously they take down one of the magic towers, which allows magic to return, and then it just stays there the rest of the series. Like, you know, they... And then they find out that, okay, the Evil King was being controlled by a demon the whole time. Like, just all that standard stuff happens in the original series, and then it moves on to them fighting Erewhon, the evil demon lord. In this alternate version, we are going to remove a bunch of the interpersonal drama. Not get rid of it entirely. Like, I think the stuff between Kaol and Selena slash Aelin uh, is actually decent, because again, it, he's upset with her for lying to him about her being a princess, and she's like, why the hell would I tell you you're working for the guy that murdered my entire family and would probably kill me if he ever found out what happened, and in addition, you got one of my friends killed, so why, why would I do that? And then he's like, okay, that's fair enough, but I'm still a little annoyed with you, and so again, they like are able to forgive each other for doing unpleasant things, because they both get it, but also the, the love they once shared is it's just gone now. All the romantic feelings are gone, and they fall in love with other people, so... Like, I think that could be left pretty much as is. Uh, again, maybe trimmed down a bit. Uh, but a lot of the other drama doesn't need to be there. Instead, we will focus on Arabin, who is the crime boss that Selena used to work for. Uh, he's the guy that actually raised her after her family died and trained her up to be an assassin. And he's... N n I, okay, it's not implied. He just straight up is a child groomer. And he is kind of... Has this creepy possessive love of Selena now that she's an adult. And it's... Uh, it's uncomfortable and unpleasant, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable and unpleasant, so we'll leave that as is. But he's just going to be the big focus throughout most of this book. See, in the original book, they do fight against him and they do kill him, but the, what they do is they just have one of their friends, who is a prostitute that Arbin has sex with a lot, they just have her wait for him to fall asleep and stab him to kill him, and it's just, it's just that easy. Uh, and they also replace his will where it's being held in a vault so that everything gets left to them instead uh, of who it was supposed to originally be left to. Uh, but that all happens completely off screen. Like, it just comes up, oh, oh yeah, by the way, Selena, being the ungodly Mary Sue she is, just went off and did this off screen. And like I even mentioned in my original review that that could have been a really cool subplot to follow. Like, just the heist where they have to, number one, make a condensing forgery and then Number two, break into the bank, uh, replace the will without getting caught, and then leave, and then they could kill Arabin. Like, that could have been really fun, but the story was more concerned with making Selena look cool and look smart than it was with telling a convincing story. Or, not convincing, a compelling story. And that really is the problem with uh, Mary Sue's at the end of the day. Like, it's more concerned with making them look good than with making everything else good. So in the altered version, again, we will focus a lot more on Arabin. We'll keep his relationship with Selena more or less intact so that they can still have that weird rivalry where he's creepily in love and possessive of her. But we're just going to spend a lot more time with the characters doing all that stuff I just mentioned. Like, 
they're going to say, okay, we need to kill him, but that's not going to be easy. And moreover, we need, like, all the resources that he has in order to take down the king, so we're going to have to replace his will in order to steal all that. So they will come up with this whole long plan, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of it here, but again, just use your imagination, make it a heist story, uh, where first they have to make a convincing forgery of the will, then they have to find a way to break into the vault where it's kept and replace it without getting caught. And then once that's done, they're like, okay, now we have to kill Arabin, and so they have to go through a whole long process to do that. And I, I think Selena should be the one to kill him. Like, it, it doesn't have to be that way, but again, she is an assassin. We're trying to make her look like one of the greatest assassins ever. She should be the one to assassinate this guy. And again, we can go into uh, parts where like, oh shit, the plan didn't work out, and now we have to improvise and have some action bits and everything, and it'll still be a lot of fun, but... It shouldn't be as easy as it was originally, is what I'm getting at. In the original, there's also a scene where Selena pretends to be a ballerina, and she, like, is perfectly able to do all these dance moves and everything, despite not training for months or years like real ballerinas have to do, which, again, that annoyed me a lot. Uh, but in the, again, in the original story, she does it perfectly, and it works out great. In this, we'll have a very similar scene, but it fails. Like, she doesn't pull it off and gets caught and they have to improvise. And after that, the alternate version will be very similar to the original. Like, there's a final battle where they break the tower and restore magic, and then they fight and defeat the king. Uh, only now, instead of him being possessed by a demon and him getting kind of redeemed at the end right before he dies, we just have it be like, hey, he was just an evil dude, okay? We, maybe we could still have it so that he's working with demons, but he was just a greedy, power-mad conqueror who was going out and doing a lot of evil stuff because he thought he just wanted to do it, and he had the power to do it. Uh, and they'll also, like, break Dorian's collar so that he is no longer uh, controlled by his father. And maybe we could have a moment where his, the, the king apologizes to his son right before he dies, and maybe they could reconcile somewhat but he's not going to be totally redeemed, and Dorian will just have to live with the fact that, yeah, my father loved me, but he was a terrible person, because that's just much more interesting and much more compelling, both as uh, character development and as story development, than just having it be like, oh yeah, he was actually good the whole time, but he was being controlled by an evil demon. Like, again, I hate that twist so much. That might be my most hated part of the series. And we will end the original series there, okay? We, we will just have it be like, yep, uh, Otterlin will restore Selena to the throne of her kingdom, and Dorian's in charge now, and everything isn't perfect, but he's gonna try and fix things, and that it'll be, like, a mostly happy ending, but there will still be some sequel baiting, where it's like, hey, uh, the evil demons are out there, and they might come and attack soon. And like I said earlier, it is kind of surprising how little it takes to fix the early books in this series. Like, I still hate them, don't get me wrong, but they're more clumsy and self-indulgent than anything else. You know, like, a lot of the events that happen are awkward, but they're not the worst things ever. And, like, the later books do get worse, and part of that is because the later books get stretched out way, way more than the original books already were. But they're just... I don't know, like, the original series, looking back on it, I, I hate it, but I don't hate it as much as I could have. So then we go to book five, which is Empire of Storms, and honestly, I think this is the worst in the series, uh, at, least, at least the worst in the original series, because it's not as long as Kingdom of Ash, the last one, but I don't know, at least Kingdom of Ash was the end. <laughs> Whereas Empire of Storms, I got to the end and I was like, well, fuck, I still got more books after this. Uh, so this one is Arawan, the Demon King, attacking and taking over and destroying stuff, and it's just them trying to fight back against him. And largely, though, it is just romance bullshit. It is smut. Again, this is the first book where, like, actual porn starts coming in. And a huge chunk of the book is just Selena and her friends begging a pirate for help. And at the end, Maeve, uh, remember Selena's great-grandmother, super powerful fae, comes in and captures Selena, and her friends just immediately after she's captured, they just have an army now because apparently Selena sent out word to her her other friends who had armies who we had never heard about, or at least you could have heard about it if you read the prequel book, but 
you shouldn't have to read prequels to understand the fucking story, you know? That, that's the same issue I have with stuff like Kingdom Hearts. Like, it just brings up these uh, plot ideas and world-building elements completely out of nowhere, and if you haven't played literally every game in the series, you won't understand it. Like, that's a similar issue here. Uh, like, her friends just gather an army off-screen, and then it'll be like, okay, uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of this book. We'll see you next time. And it's just unsatisfying because even if the characters put in effort to do this, we don't actually see any of that effort. So, instead, this version of the book will keep it similar, don't get me wrong, uh, but I think it should be a couple of years later. Like, not forever later, but maybe three years, four years, five years, just something like that. So these people could have uh, moved on with their lives, started rebuilding from all the previous carnage that had happened, uh, and, you know, Selena could be getting used to being queen for a little while, Dorian could be used to getting king, uh, but they may not be totally satisfied with their current lives, but they are getting used to them, you know? So it's years later, and the book will be largely about Selena traveling from place to place and gathering allies to fight against Arawan and the demons. You know, because ma maybe it could start off with like, oh shit, a portal is now open and they're all coming through. What are we going to do? Burp, 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 burp. Like, Dorian gets uh, overthrown very early on in the original book, and he's just not king anymore. I think we could do that with him. We could also maybe do it with Selena. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but yes, this book is, the altered version of the book is going to be them going around gathering allies and just trying to convince people, hey, we should work together. Like, we could still have the bit with them trying to convince the pirate to help them, but that won't take up nearly as much time. And it'll be like, we'll go there, get him to help us. We'll go somewhere else, get him to help us. Go somewhere else, get him to help us. I, I, I'm aware this is just the plot to Dragon Age Origins, but fuck you, I like that game. So, yeah, we'll, we're just making this Dragon Age Origins. And the end will be pretty much the same, with Selena being captured by Maeve. But now, at least, when they're like, okay, well, we, we have an army, it, it, they at least had to work for it. Book six is Tower of Dawn, and this one is actually, like, more of a spin-off than an actual entry in the series, because... See, at the end of book four, Kale got injured and lost the use of his legs, so they, he just goes to another continent to try and find a way to do it. And Tower of Dawn takes place around the same time as Empire of Storms, and it's just Kale regaining use of his legs. And honestly, I didn't read that one, <laughs> and like I admitted to that in my original review, so I just didn't talk about it much. I was like, hey, maybe it's good, maybe it's terrible. I'm not commenting on it much. Uh, I assume it has a lot of the same issues as the other books where it's just like ungodly stretched out when it doesn't need to be. So we'll just apply all those issues here, or all those same solutions here. And other than that, I'm just not going to talk about it because I don't think it'd be fair for me to talk about something I haven't read. Then finally we reach book seven, Kingdom of Ash. And this one is largely the same as book five where, yeah, there's some battle sequences, there's some action stuff. Uh, it's largely romance bullshit. It's, like, there's just not that much to say. Like, that is the biggest problem with this, is that it is just so ungodly long and stretched out, but it feels like there's very little happening there. So we will leave it largely intact. We will still have Selena escaping from captivity with Maeve, although it's just going to be Selena escaping herself. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time with her friends also planning on how they're going to break her out, because that was an annoying part. Like, we had a really long section of her friends planning how they're going to break her out and preparing for that. And then we had a really long section with Selena breaking herself out, and then she breaks herself out, and so all the stuff with her friends wound up being pointless. Like, we'll just, we'll just cut that out. Uh, we'll, again, cut out the porn. Uh, and it is revealed that her great-grandmother Maeve was, is not actually a fae, she's actually a demon. And part of the reason why Erewhon is invading with his army is to take her and drag her back to their demon realm. And she doesn't want that. And I actually like that twist. I think it's a pretty good one. Although I think we should just hint at it a bit more throughout the rest of the series. Like, hint at, like, hey, something's up with uh, Maeve. Like, she's not weakened when she leaves Wendlin like she should be. What's up with that? You know, things like that. I also think that Selena should be hinted at to not quite be Fey either. Like, there, there'll be something wrong with her and something wrong with her powers that people just aren't sure about. And it's because she's actually part demon rather than part Fey. So... Just, again, that, that would be a little bit more interesting, a little bit cooler. And other than that, like, the main change that I would bring to this one is that uh, at the end of this book, Selena kind of 
for whatever reason, she just brings democracy to her kingdom. And, like, I, I'm not saying that's a problem, but it completely comes out of nowhere. Like, she says, yeah, I'm going to be queen, but I'm also going to have people from different areas elect representatives to come to me and tell me about their problems so that I can help fix them better and be a better leader. And, like, again, I do think that's genuinely uh, a good thing to, to put in here. Like, it, it'd be a good change uh, for the people living there and everything. It's just odd because it comes, again, completely out of nowhere. So I think uh, throughout the whole series, we could have Selena mention it and bring it up earlier because, again, she is not a true princess. She is a bastard. She lived as a commoner for however many years before being forced to switch with her sister. And then after her family was killed, she was forced to live as a commoner again. So she understands like, how the system screws people over. And so this series, rather than just being okay, we put a good person on the throne and then everything's better. Like, there is actually some change being made to try and help make things better. Like, I think that would work. It just needs to be brought up a little bit earlier and hinted at. You know, before when doing this rewrite stuff, I've had to gloss over the problems with books because they're just too bad or too confusing and there just, like, isn't much of a way that I could make it work without going in and completely rewriting everything, which isn't really the point of this exercise. And here I also had to gloss over a lot of changes and be kind of vague, but it's not because it's too bad or too confusing to fix, it's because it's just dull and repetitive. You know, like, I don't want to say the exact same things over and over and over again. So that's why I just said, like, eh, trim out some of the subplots and everything. Like, uh, again, the final book, Kingdom of Ash, is around a thousand pages originally. I think it could probably be 600, maybe 700, and tell basically the same story. So, I don't know, it just, like I said, it gave me a little bit more of an appreciation for the series, although I still hate it, let's be clear. <laughs> I do not like Throne of Glass. Trying to go through all that crap was miserable for a variety of reasons, but I'm like, the events, for the most part, are not awful. They're just awkward and stretched out and yeah that's about it like that's how i would rewrite throne of glass to make it decent you know it would be a decent young adult fantasy series i don't know if it would be as successful as it is now maybe it'd be more maybe it'd be less maybe other ya fantasy would not be trying to copy it as much and they'd be doing other stuff i don't know that's young adult stuff is very very susceptible to trends uh but whatever the case is this would be a much better version of the story so uh, are there any changes that you would make that I didn't bring up here or any different changes that you would make are there anything is there anything I brought up here that I, you think would actually make the story worse I, I don't know just let me know down in the comments below because I'm just I'm just curious what other people have to think and if you hate throne of glass as much as I do or less and also uh, go to the link in the pinned comment so that you can sign up for email list and get access to this super cool limited edition plushie again limited edition. If you want your own little mini version of James in your room, then uh, you're, you're gonna have to sign up for it. Anyways, that's all. Uh, subscribe, like the video, comment on it, all, all that stuff you're supposed to do, and uh, I'll, uh, follow me on social media stuff. Goodbye. Hello and aloha to everyone who watched this far. I appreciate you. You see all these names here? Yeah, these are the names of my patrons. They're the people that send me money once a month over on Patreon. So if you want your name here, then consider sending me some. And my $10 and up patrons are Oppo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, James M, Carcat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. And really everyone who watched this, you know, you're you're all great. I wouldn't be here without you. So, uh, you know, thank thank you. Rate, video, comment, subscribe, find me on other social places and I'll uh, I'll see you next time, uh, I think, hopefully, maybe. Maybe I'll be dead by then. I don't know. Goodbye.